I'm Peter Levine, the director of the Defense Management Institute, and we are here today as a part of a planned series of interviews of individuals who have made significant contributions to improving the management of the Department of Defense. Today we're speaking to the Honorable David Norquist, who served as the 34th Deputy Secretary of Defense from 2019 to 2021, and as DOD Comptroller from 2017 to 2019. Secretary Norquist is currently the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Defense Industrial Association and a member of the Congressional Commission for the Reform of the Defense Planning, Programming, Budgeting, and Execution System. Dave is not only one of the smartest people you will ever meet, he is also one of the most thoughtful on issues of defense reform. Dave, welcome. We're happy to have you here today. Thank you for having me here, Peter. Dave, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What brought you to the Department of Defense? People don't become Deputy Secretary by accident. There must be a route that took you there. So there's two parts to the route. The most direct was I was in graduate school, and the federal government had a program called what was then called Presidential Management Intern, now Presidential Management Fellows Program, where they go to graduate schools and public administration and recruit people. You apply, you go through a testing process, and then you interview with different agencies. That's what recruited me to the federal government. The reason I ended up in the Army was a little bit different, which is when I entered college as a freshman, I was standing in line to go through a tour of the library. And two Army ROTC cadets showed up and said, you can go tour the library, but the library is kind of boring. It's just a library. If you come with us, we're going to go shoot on the rifle range, and we're going to go repel off a wall. And I said, that sounds way more fun. So I wasn't on scholarship, but I hung out with them. I ended up doing several years of Army ROTC. A childhood eye injury kept me from being commissioned, but I was coming out of three years of working with Army ROTC. So when I started interviewing at federal agencies, and the, the Army was one of them, that's the one I picked. That was the one I found the most interesting. You were not turned off by the bureaucracy you faced so that you never wanted to come back to federal government again. So I was... No, I was actually surprised by the fact that I could make a difference. And so that was you know, one of the first jobs I had. I worked for Army Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And in Army Intelligence, the, they did a process. We had program budget analysts. We, the programming budgeting was one function. And we had assembled the General Defense Intelligence Program budget. And I thought it was a really bad use of leadership's time, the way it was scheduled, how much time it took. They had three different sets of IT systems to make it work. So I basically wrote the equivalent of a college paper to my SES and said, you can do this better. I would recommend you try this different. They sent me off to training, and when I came back, the SES said, we liked your paper. You get to do it. So your job was to implement it. And so we, we switched it. We got rid of the system. And I was making $24,000 a year at the time. And my SES said to me, you just saved us a million dollars. We got rid of a million dollar a year contract with that IT. And at that point, I was hooked. Right At that point, my view is, that's way too much fun, and I got into it then. Now, somehow you made your way from there to the appropriations, the Defense Appropriations yes. Subcommittee. How, how did you find your way there? At so the, the mentor I had helped me do a couple of different assignments in the Army. I was looking at going to the Hill. The legislative affairs person for Army Intelligence encouraged me to take a detail up there. It took a little while for the, the Hill to work that out, so I went to a base in England for a year, mm -hmm. got some experience, and then they came through and they said, okay, come be detailed to us which was a polite way of the Hill saying, come play with us for a year. If you don't like us or we don't like you, no harm, no foul. You can go back to the Army and we can, can stay on. But if it works out, we'll hire you. So it was like a test period. Yeah. They ended up picking me up, and I was there from like 97 to 2003. The, um, you and I share, share uh, a, a common experience in that we worked on the Hill before we worked in senior positions in right. the department. You had... A, a, you had more experience in the executive branch before that, but still, mm -hmm. as, as at a more senior level, you, you, you mm -hmm. had the, the congressional experience. Are there things that you learned when you came to the department um, in the senior position mm -hmm. that you wish you'd have known when you were on Capitol Hill? So I think that part of the advantage I had coming over from the department was you understood what people going to build the budget did. So when you were reading it, part of the reason our committee tended to hire budget analysts was they knew how they were built and they knew the background. I still think that the, my experience hadn't let me understand the senior leadership level. Mm -hmm. And so when I was dealing with the Hill, understanding all the steps the department went through to assemble it at the most senior level was a little bit different. What surprised you most coming over to the, to the department in a senior position? When I left the Hill and, came to the, the Hill department? and came to the department? So I came over into the, uh, the comptroller, comptroller shop as one of the deputies there. And I think it was how 
hard it was for any one person to understand all the other functions being done in the department. How few people in the comptroller shop really understood the acquisition process, or how many people in the requirements process didn't understand the budget. Not they didn't have a vague understanding, but mm -hmm. the mechanics of them were their own universe, and people had very little exposure to the others. And so the coordination was a really big challenge. Yeah. I'll come back to some of the things you did in, in Comptroller's office and DOD, obviously, mm -hmm. but I want to go forward. You, since you've left the department, you've gone to work um, not exactly in, uh, sort of in private industry. I mean, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're working for NDIA. It's not for a company. But right. are there, are there, is there a perspective you've gotten from working outside of the department, outside of the government, um, that has given you, given you insight into things you wish you'd known when you were in the department? So I think in twofold. First, when I first time I went out of the government, I went eight years into uh, a accounting firm, and we provided services back to the government. And I started to learn a lot more about the vendor's view of a proposal. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that if I wasn't aware that a proposal was coming out before it came out, I was probably too late. Versus when I was in government, I assumed there was a pristine, no one knew was coming, and it was this immaculate conception that everyone would read it. If you're in the private sector, there's not enough information just in the proposal to really understand what the government had wanted unless you had some, some conversations. So that's what I learned on, on that side. In the, the current job I have, it's also about what drives industry. When are they willing to make an investment? When are they willing to make a commitment? And what is the signal they look for from government? And it's not a speech, right? The government thinks I gave you a speech, I issued a strategy, and the industry think, thinking is, well, that's great. But until you're signing and awarding contracts, you may completely change your mind, and frequently you do, we'll wait. Yeah. And so that's some of the challenges. I, I have no doubt that people who are, who are in government today listen to you. Certainly they should listen mm -hmm. to you. Do you think you're able to have an impact on, on policy by bringing that perspective to people or certain? Yeah, oh, certain absolutely. Today? You can, I meet with people, uh, I waited my ethics recusal. Mm -hmm. Once I got to the other side, I went back to meeting with people in the government. And part of it was, I knew from my time in similar jobs how busy I was just working the department, and therefore what sort of information from the outside would be useful. And some of it's, I can bring you small businesses that are experiencing the following mm -hmm. so that you can ask them questions. And the idea is when you're in the government, when you're in the Pentagon, you need to get out to the field, whether it's a field site with a, with a combat unit, whether it's a deployed, whether it's industry or factory, to see whether or not the policy you issued up here is actually changing the facts on the ground down there. And I've been in experiences where, you know, we traveled to Afghanistan and they were getting their hands tied up with the, with the bureaucratic process because the policy had defined it at an 06 level instead of an 05, because the 06 was nearby in Iraq, but they weren't in Afghanistan. And so they didn't even think of the fact that we could simply adjust the policy. But when I was out there, I saw that. I mentioned it to the comptroller. We changed it before the evening sun went down. But they would have never thought to have asked for the change in policy. And we would never have thought to realize that there was such a delay being caused by that one difference between the two countries. Um, let me turn to, to now the time that you were in office. When, the mm -hmm. first thing I want to ask you about is, is uh, the Advanta data analytics mm -hmm. platform. You were, I believe, uh, played a critical role in initiating mm -hmm. that, that, that system. Can you describe your, your vision for Advanta and how you expect it to advance the DOD decision-making process? Sure. So Advanta, for those who, who aren't familiar with it, is a data lake, holds billions of transactions, and its origin comes out of the financial statement audit. In order to pass an audit, you have to have transaction level detail. So individually, what you're buying and selling, what you're adding to inventory. Most DOD systems didn't function that way. They would roll up a series of transactions as a block. And when you have that, you can't do any analysis on it because you, you, don't, you lose the, the individual detail. By moving to systems that had transaction level detail for the audit, we now could create this data lake and using some very sophisticated modern data analytic tools, data visualization tools, you could ask questions and see answers to problems that before were not visible. And originally we started mostly with the financial management community because they were the ones that were part of the audit, they understood it, and they were able to, instead of looking each quarter at a report that said you're 25% of the way through the year, you're 20% obligated out of this account and go do homework, they could say, forget in summaries, individually which 
function, which line in the budget has had no activity in the last three months? And what's the story there? So they could do much more sophisticated questions. So that was the original, but the vision that we did was you have a set of data being audited that you can increase the reliability of over time, a powerful tool of data analytics that lets you look at that information at the event level, and then a series of questions and missions that people have in the department whose problems you can solve. So it started in financial management, it spread to acquisition, personnel, uh, joint staff started using it. All of them was how do I help you answer your questions that used to be data calls. I mean, I remember we used to spend enormous times back when I was in Army Intelligence. How many people do we have who speak this particular language? And you do some records call. Well, those sort of things you can just look up, right? And you can get instant answers, uh, which also drives up the accuracy of the data, because when people are using it that way, the, the owner of the data has to keep it up to date. And we still have, obviously, that Advanta is fed by hundreds, if not mm -hmm. thousands, of different systems, right. um, which have varying quality of data Correct. Um, and, and interconnectivity and, and, mm -hmm. and other problems with them. I take it that Advanta doesn't solve those problems. It solves part of them. So okay. part of the thing you can solve with Advanta is, I'm bringing your data over, and I realize you use O's instead of zeros. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fix that because I know how to translate that. Mm -hmm. So they, they organize it so that it has the information that makes it searchable in a way the original version wasn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change the fact if the original data is missing. And I'll just use a, an example. Um, when we did the financial statement audit, they went out and visited facilities and they looked at the books and said, if it's on your property book, is it on the base? If it's on the base, is it on the property book? 5% of the buildings in the Navy's property book no longer existed. Over the previous years, they had been knocked down and removed, but nobody had taken them out of the system. Advana wouldn't see that because it would be looking at the database, but the audit does. And so when you have those flags that says you've got a problem here, the Navy went through and cleaned it up and the next audit came through and they were 99.9% .9 accuracy. But that's why you need to have somebody going out and poking the data through the audit or through internal means to tell you which systems are reliable which systems aren't, and what do I need to do to bring them up to standard? This is where I think you're a starry eyed optimist because I don't think any of the systems are reliable, but that's me. Well, first of all, they, in many cases they are because they're yeah. listing the exact transaction that yeah. occurred. Uh, and we have to have the receipt, we have to have the invoice, so you have to have that set. Yeah. What you need to know is, if, are you asking it a question it wasn't set up to answer? And frequently then you'll start to find errors because the person who's running it doesn't fill in those fields or doesn't care. That's a that's a management use limitation you have to understand. Yeah, um, the department is divided into many different pillars: mm -hmm. um, undersecretaries and OSD, the military departments and services, the mm -hmm. Joint Staff and Combat Commands. Um, as Deputy Secretary, you were one of only two officials in the department who actually had responsibility for all of them. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the challenges of trying to get those pillars to work together? So I think as the deputy. What you do is you, you first start with what's the strategic mission, right? Mm -hmm. What's the secretary's vision? What's the national defense strategy call for? Mm -hmm. And that helps guide how you prioritize your time because you're not going to be able to solve everything, right? You've got to focus on the, the key ones. Is it innovation and technology? Is it a fielding of, a, of the next triad? What are those key things? And many of those show up through the budget. That's where the choices often appear. Part of its personalities. What are the leaderships of different ones type? As a manager, you start to learn who are the people who they get the vision, they've got the plan. All I need to do is occasionally move obstacles out of their way mm -hmm. and, and check who are the people that I have to provide the vision to and help sure they get it. And where are the places where I have to make a connection because left to their devices, the two processes will run on their own paths. And you need to bring them together so that the left hand and the right hand know what each other's doing. The deputy can call meetings in a way that's very effective to try and put an issue in front and reconcile some of those disagreements or bring those issues together. Do you have a, a, an approach to delegation that you use when it's appropriate to delegate and when you have to hold the strings yourself? I do, and it's typically based around having enough experience with the person to understand that they have the vision and they can explain their plan. And if they can do those things, and everything you have a couple of guardrails, like if this happens, I need to be alerted to it. And what you discover is you have people who, when given that, consistently do the right thing and give you the right feedback and you're good. Other people do the right thing, but 
don't always give you feedback, so you have to have more meetings just to make sure you're hearing. And then you have some people that either they don't quite get the vision or they're very disruptive in how they deal with other people that you've got to manage more carefully. And so some folks, the best you can do, the most effective you can do is, is elevate them through that process. They don't first get the vision, then they understand it. They start to explore their ideas of how to execute. You give them some guidance that makes them more effective. Now they're off and, and on the races. You described a problem in, that you saw in Afghanistan at the 0506 level, mm -hmm. uh, which I would characterize, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, as a not realizing that you could escalate an issue and mm -hmm. get it solved. Correct. That um, was the problem. I presume that you have that that you see that same problem on occasion at the undersecretary level. You see it at all levels, right? And you see people who either don't realize they can escalate an issue to fix it. They accept certain boundaries as given and don't understand that you can change them. There's a dramatic version of this given to me when I was a Hill staffer because I was explained that there was something they wanted to do. And I said, well, well you can't. That's against the rules. And they explained to me, David, when the president signs the law and this is the new law, that changes the rules. It is legal by definition. <laughs> that was a little scary as a Hill staffer to, mm -hmm. to, to terms of that. But even inside the department, many of the controls are policy controls. There is somebody who owns it. They can update it. What you have to do is understand why the old rule was there. There's a very strong temptation to say, I want to do something. There's a rule in the way. I need to get rid of the rule. No. You need to first understand why the rule was put in. What was the problem it was designed to solve? What was it designed to prevent? Now you can adjust it to solve what you're trying to solve because you know why how to keep it doing what its purpose is without blocking the new thing you're trying to accomplish. The, uh, and the counterpart to the problem of delegation, I think, is the mm -hmm. problem of information. And when you're yeah. in a senior position, how do you ensure that you're getting good information to make your decisions on when you've got people below you who can be choke points, who can right. uh, either intentionally or unintentionally limit the information you have for decision-making purposes? How do, you, how do you face that? So a couple of things. First is you set up a regular process for normal information, whether it's uh, regular meetings with the staff so that the undersecretary or other can bring stuff to your attention. It may be a weekly report. My Saturday mornings in the Pentagon was reading the combatant commander's weekly reports to the secretary, the undersecretary's weekly reports to me, just so you're following what's going on and they always have a way to put something in front of you. The second thing is you have people who work for you in other places who are in other meetings who can let you know about issues that are getting stuck that haven't come all the way up. And often in, in meetings when we're having discussions, I try and draw those out. So aside from those normal channels, you'll have a, a function or an or a topic where you're going to bring an issue before the DMAG to discuss the budget or on cybersecurity in a different form. Those you then try and pull out what the potential obstacles are. And one of the things that I learned early in my career was from Myers-Briggs, the extroverts will speak up. The introverts will tend not to unless you call on them by name. And so I started to learn that in meetings, rather than simply say, does anyone have an issue, which would only get me about half the room to speak, I would just go around the room and say, Susan, any comments on this one? Bob, any concerns? And frequently you get very powerful comments from people who were waiting for you to ask for their advice in a way that you meant it. And by calling on them, they felt invited in. And they may not be the most senior person in the room, but if you call on them and they have a concern, they say, well, I'm worried about this, you bring that out. And that's part of, of the job of just being open to it. The other part is don't shoot the messenger. There's a lot of managers who do that, and then they shoot the messenger, and then they wonder why no one brings the problems to their attention again. Yeah. Um, I talked about the pillars so that, that the department is built around. Um, the department is also unique in that it has both a, a civilian and a military leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, the issue of civilian military relations in the department has been, I guess, highlighted in recent years by the mm -hmm. fact we've had two recent secretaries of defense who, mm -hmm. were, who were retired general officers. What's your view on the state of, of civil military relations in the department? Um, and is the, balance, is the balance working the way it should be working? So I think it can be a challenge. Um, I found it worked very well on the budget side because that almost heavily falls through the civilian side, the military is in support, um, and they have a proper place to roll in providing the information on what the requirements are. That tends to work well. 
It can be a little more of a challenge in policy, and that's because depending on who the head of the Undersecretary for Policy is and who the senior military person is, if the secretary only looks one direction for information, he's cutting out either his entire joint staff or his entire Undersecretary of Policy shop. Most secretaries are good about going both ways. Some of them have a clear preference, and that I think is one of the most common areas where you'll see concern about civilians in the military. Do you, would you, do you have any advice for senior leaders or future senior leaders in the department, civilian senior leaders, on, on, on how best to address that relationship successfully? Sure. I think the first one is understand there are certain meetings where you always should have a certain set of players in the room. So when I was there, Secretary Esper would have a meeting on foreign policy issues. The Undersecretary of Policy was always there. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was always there. The deputy secretary was there, and the vice was there. So two different civilians, two different military. That was his small group when he just had to have an, an update to make sure that he was hearing from the different corners. Different topics, acquisition, others would have a different group. But I always encourage folks, know who the different leadership is, make sure they're in the room. And then the only weakness you have is if one of them isn't outspoken or strong, then the leader's got to figure out how to pull that into the process. Who was that group when you were comptroller? In terms of who did I meet with when I was the comptroller? Were, were there were there military people who were relevant that you would bring in? I mean, obviously you have the the, the various you know the the, the three stars and those kinds of things. Right. That you have the joint staff, right? but informally, who are the key pe key players you would want to consult with? So Tony Rardi was the was the <laughs> joint staff person um, when I was there as deputy secretary. Cartwright was the was the general that was there when I was comptroller. Those are the ones on the joint staff who had the resource management function and would be part of those meetings. My staff always had people they worked with. Many of the folks who run the budget inside the services, their senior person would be a military, and then they'd have a civilian assistant secretary. So I would try and include both of those groups in the discussions. Um, the Senate version of the National Defense Authorization Act has a provision in it that would restore the chief management officer. Mm -hmm. um, you were in the department in senior positions when the, we had a chief management officer mm -hmm. before. Um, you saw how that worked firsthand. What do you see as the advantages and disadvantages of a CMO position? So I think the challenge with the CMO as it was set up most recently is the CMO can be very valuable in championing change. But they can't really lead it in the sense that if you look at the major reforms that were done when I was there, the, the way they changed the background investigation process, that was led by the, the head of INS, right? The adaptive acquisition framework, that was led by the head of acquisition. The audit and Advana, that was led by the comptroller. In each case, the subject matter expert for that domain was the primary champion. Now, in many cases, they could have other groups help them. The deputy secretary is often key for moving obstacles out of the way. There may be cross-cutting aspects of that function. But when you take an, an outside organization, say your job is to drive change over things you don't own, they have a very hard time doing it. And if you try and make them own everything, you end up creating its entire second bureaucracy. So there's also been a challenge over time. I think the Hill has changed or revisited the concept of a CMO Every other year, they change the title, they move the position, they think if we elevate it, it'll be somehow different. So it's moved a lot. The most recent incarnation of this, which I, I think is a gets to the key point, which is Deputy Secretary Hicks's setting up of the Institute, right? Mm -hmm. And the goal here is, I don't need someone who tells everybody else what to do, right? Those are senior people, they can run the organization. But even a senior undersecretary who's trying to drive change does not have the time to say, what was done in the commercial sector on this? What are best practices? Where do I turn to? Having an organization that can help solve those problems, that comes back to them and says, we can give you three case studies. We can answer this problem. We can find you some experts. Usually in the department, you can get a champion. What the champion runs into is resistance and time. And anyone who can help them overcome the resistance improve the, the likelihood of success and speed them up, that's where you make a difference. So I really think that trying to recreate a, a new bureaucracy in the Pentagon is a, is a step in the wrong direction. But I believe that what Deputy Secretary Hicks is trying to do is a trying to get what is the most valuable part of the intent of the CMO without 
the challenges that the, the CMO ran into, at least in its most recent in, in car, uh, formation. There have been other versions before that may have worked well. There's one that was inside the deputy's office, and that, that had potential. But then they said, your job is conferences and travel. Well, at that point, you've, you've started to damn the organization because you've given them non-reform-focused administrative functions, and I think that was unhelpful to that mission. Um, you and I served together on the PPBE Reform mm -hmm. Commission. One of the issues we're all struggling with as commissioners is how far-reaching our proposals should right. be. Can you describe how you approach this, this problem philosophically, when it's appropriate to try to break things and start over, and mm -hmm. when it's more appropriate to stick with incremental improvements to the existing system? So I think the question of how dramatic of a change you make depends on how big of a difference you can get from that change. And so I always walk into a, something saying, I'm perfectly willing to dramatically change this if it's worth the transition cost. And there's always a meaningful transition cost in the government. I think when you look at an issue like PPBS, the first thing you have to say is, well, what's the alternative vision? If I didn't run it this way, right, if I wasn't just making incremental changes, what would that look like? And if you can lay out that vision, and people can kick it around and see the strengths and the weaknesses, then you can have the conversation that says, well, how much work is it going to take to get there from here? You can also put with it, well, here are some of the changes that put you on the direction to get those benefits. And then over time, what people might do is start to move you from one to the other. It may not be a heroic in one move. But I do think it's useful to say, there are alternatives to this, and here's what they look like. And that lets people say, hmm, it's not enough of an improvement. Or, wow, that really is. I can't believe we're not doing it that way. Stepping back from the PPPE Commission, um, I guess Advanta would fit in this category, but maybe you have another one. Can you, can you give an example of, of, of a successful reform or a dramatic reform that you were able to work on that, that you think made a difference? Sure. So I'll, uh, Advanta was one of the lessons learned. I'll go back to the reform, and then I'll come back to Advanta. Okay. So when I went to Homeland Security, I was their CFO. I was their first Senate-confirmed CFO. So it was a, basically a, a new start. Uh, I think it was 20-some-odd organizations came together. It was the third largest federal agency. And as their CFO, no policies and procedures, no internal, you know, no audit. And so we had to put all of that in place, put in training programs for the new hires, establish sound procedures. One of the key emphasis we had was, it's not helpful to have a procedure unless I can see if the procedure is failing. So how am I testing the internal controls of the department to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse, and mismanagement. We put in place a process to get us to a clean opinion on an audit, they being with DOD the only other ones that weren't getting a clean opinion. And every year we could track the number of material weaknesses going down, the number of challenges going down. They've now had a clean opinion, I think, for close to 10 years, right? There's whole people there who didn't remember that they didn't used to have a clean opinion, that this was supposed to be some insurmountable obstacle. The one thing that I didn't do when I was there was have the universe of transactions. We were able to solve the audit issue without creating the data, which meant we got a clean opinion, but we really didn't change the process. So one of the lessons I had when I came to DOD was, I'm really less concerned about the clean opinion at the end, useful, need to get it, important for the American people, but I want the benefits along every step of the way, and the, the reforms on the inventory and others, and the data analytics that the audit gives you by creating that universe of transactions, that's going to be the powerful change. And that's the thing we need to have up front. So that was the objective or an objective of the, of the Advanta system then when you brought that's it That's right. That was, that, that was probably, the, in my view, the primary, after getting inventory right, one of the primary benefits of the audit was the data analytics tool, all of which would happen long before you got to a clean opinion. Because I remembered from Homeland, it took 10 years to get a clean opinion. So if that's the only benefit, that's a long wait. What are the things along the way that make this worthwhile? The House version of the NDAA would eliminate an office called Cost Assessment and Performance Evaluation, or mm -hmm. CAPE. Um, what's your view of the role of CAPE in the department's decision-making process? Um, do you think it provides value and should be maintained? So there's an important function that the Deputy Secretary relies on, which is I need independent analytical capability to help me address certain problems. Previously, you just get the services recommendation, and the challenge was always the service had a, a recommended solution, and you couldn't pressure test it, or you couldn't compare it to alternatives. Part of the reason then PA&E, Program Analysis and Evaluation, was stood up was to address that. CAPE was then they added 
cost estimating is a way to, to help that function. That capability needs to exist inside the department in order to have an analytically driven and sound process. It's been in different forms. It's been in different places. You know, much like the CMO, you can have many arguments over where it should be. But the notion of needing that skill set and that function very closely where the, the deputy secretary and the secretary can turn to it to address the biggest challenges, that's essential. And I think whatever they do, that's, that's the key function. You served as comptroller. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some people who, I, who don't understand why we have a comptroller to do budgeting and a CAPE to do mm -hmm. programming. Mm -hmm. Can you describe uh, the, re the relationship between the two offices and what they do and, and why, if you think it makes sense to have two of them, why we have two? Sure. So I'll walk through them, and, and there's a difference in, in original intent and structure, and then there's places where there's, it's convoluted, so I'll try and take them on. So the primary difference between the two, before you get to words like programming and budgeting, is CAPE is an analytical team that has the time and the resources to be given a problem, go look at long-range strike and compare different types of long-range strike and tell us what the answer is, right? And they go off and they do the analysis. Comptroller is mainly filled with people who have a, a timeline sequence steps to do. They have to assemble the budget for the Hill. Now, they have an analytical skill set of what should be in the budget, what are the priorities. Every federal agency CFO does that. But they deliver the budget by a certain date. They defend it before the Hill, and then when the budget comes in, they execute it. So they're running those functions on a schedule and don't tend, and then that's their their key part of the dollar side. The analytical group in CAPE is often looking over into stuff that's well into ANS's territory of which platforms. It's working with joint staff about the warfighting requirements. It used to be at one point part of Comptroller, right? They originally set up as the same thing over in Homeland Security. Both of them were in the same in the CFO shop. So one can set them up that way, but they really are looking and connecting to the other side. Whether you need one to do programming and budgeting is, is actually an open question. And I think that's one of the things that we need to look at. When I started for Army Intelligence, I was a program budget analyst. It wasn't two functions. We didn't have this division between the two. The person who owned 97 owned 98, 99, 2000, and 2001 across it. So even if you fix that, you'd still have the difference of CAPE's job is to look out five years to the future and say, if that's the Secretary's vision, what's the bridge I build to get there? And they lay out the bridge. The Comptroller's job is to balance the near years within the top line they're given and help the Secretary make those trade-offs. But they're following the bridge path that the, comp that the CAPE team laid out. Let me, let me change gears again. Um, over the years, we've had round after round of what are called management efficiencies in the mm -hmm. department. Every time the department has a, faces tight budgets, that we, we go to a, a new round of management efficiencies as a source of, of funding so we can mm -hmm. keep paying for the things we, we, we think we need. Um, do you have any views as to whether there's really management efficiency and management efficiencies? Are, are, we, are we achieving a more efficient budget? And what, what's the relationship, I guess, between cutting costs and achieving more efficient management? So there's a couple challenges for everyone who's lived through this over and over and over again. The first is, under, if you're not properly led, the process devolves into everyone take a 3% cut and figure it out, right? And somebody has a theory that, well, any group can do better with 3% less, and everybody gets salami sliced, as they tend to say it. Not particularly helpful. There's another version of that which is more helpful, which is what Secretary Esper did where you go through and you're almost you're looking for the barnacles. What are the things that we're doing because we always have? But when push came to shove, if it wasn't already in our system, we wouldn't be starting it. That's a very useful drill every couple of years to find legacy functions that you need to shed. But when you're talking about major reforms that save significant dollar amounts, you're really talking about changing the way you perform an entire function, frequently with automation, you need the legislative change because you're probably changing a whole bunch of rules. Those are harder to come by, and they're much harder to execute. And so in those cases, what you have to be doing is looking for who do you have in your organization who has a vision for how you can do something differently? What's the changes in the support they need to be able to do it credibly? And can I build support on the, on the Hill to be able to make those reforms? Those are the ones that 
create dramatic differences in process. Those are ones where an undersecretary may have won in the course of their tour that will really make a difference. And those are the ones you have to help them push so across. So I would say, I would have said that there are two, that there's a difference in kind between mm -hmm. those two things. One is a setting of priorities and deciding things you can do without, right. in a sense. And the other is, I'm going to change the way I do business. That's right. Um, and I guess the question I have for you is, what's the relationship between changing the way you do business to make it better and saving money? Can you expect savings from that in, in, in the budget period, is the, can that be a source of savings, or is that, or are you more likely to have to invest money to improve the way you do business? It can be a source of savings, but the ones that are most effective at saving money didn't say that was what they were setting to do when they started out. So if you tell people that, and I'll just pick uh, DFAS as an example, right? They process transactions. If you said to DFAS, I'm going to make a change to save $12. Then a whole bunch of people start thinking, am I losing my job? Am I doing this? And, and you get resistance. If you said certain transactions flow all the way through our process in 15 minutes and other ones take three weeks, I want to figure out every reason why they take three weeks and streamline them, automate them so they flow like the others. Mm -hmm. Everyone likes speed. Everyone hates bureaucracy. Everyone hates the stops. When you do that, you recognize it will take me fewer people and it will cost less when I have it up and running. And I will probably be able to solve that through attrition. But I focused everyone on improving the speed and the accuracy of the data. So this is part of the reason why I care about the audit, which is the audit's all about improving the speed and the accuracy of the data. The side effect of that is you have to have fewer people typing things in. And you have to have data that moves. All of that will bring down your cost. And so you think about some of the major reforms when they went from paying everyone in person to auto deposits into the bank accounts. You went from a whole bunch of people carrying cash, securing it, delivering it, counting it out in front, a wire transfer lens in your bank account. That was a tremendous savings for industry as a trade under savings for the US government. Not an incremental one, and probably not sold on the cost savings. It was sold on the reliability, the safety of the money, the automatically having it on Friday, not a week later. Uh, but the side effect is, cost you a lot less to run that way. I would say that a lot of time when we when we in the department look to speed up processes, we look to beating up people to move faster going through the same steps as opposed to figuring out whether they really needed to do those steps at all or whether they should be doing something different. How do you get people to focus on that bigger picture? So you're right. The first one is you yeah, right, somebody yells, somebody makes a party. That actually if if the answer is Actions for this crisis are in red folders. Red folders will not sit on your desk for more than an hour. You can do that. And what you're doing is saying internally, I have a priority. These papers need to flow through the system faster. That works, but everything else is going to go slower, so that one can go faster. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But that's not a reform, right? That doesn't end un the process. To really change the process, you have to understand why was it set up this way? Mm -hmm. What am I trying to achieve? achieve alternatively? And is there a separate way altogether of getting there? And part of that is understanding a lot of your controls are there to prevent something. Well, can I automate that prevention, right? Do I have to have somebody look at the document and say, yes, I am validating these two things? Or can a computer system check the two numbers, agree they match, and keep it moving? Mm -hmm. If you don't know why the person is looking, then you don't know whether you can safely automate it. In many cases, you can realize a computer can do it faster, can do it more reliably, and can check it against multiple things that a human may or may not be doing. So you can improve the control once you understand why it's there. And I think a lot of times the problem is people don't take the patience to understand and flowchart out the process before they re-engineer it. As a senior leader who probably, at least as deputy secretary, who probably doesn't have time to do that flow chart mm -hmm. flowing of the process yourself, how do you get the people who work for you to focus on the issue in that way, in the right way? So I've had them do that. When, um, when we were at Homeland Security and we were trying to understand the bottlenecks on the southwest border, uh, we had them flow chart out every step of, of the process. And we realized the choke point was actually the number of judges which isn't even a function of the Department of Homeland Security, but more judges would reduce how many people you had to have in detention because they were getting through the court system faster. Same way in the Department of Defense. I've had people do flowcharts as part of a process and say, so, look, I want you to lay out all the steps. We brought in people to say, did they get it right? And then we could discuss the reengineering. So leadership has to ask for it. 
They don't have the time to prepare it. They may not have the skill set themselves to, sec to check it, but they can bring in experts who can, and then they can say, okay, what's the alternative look like? Um, when you were, I think we, 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 you mentioned this, when you were a CFO at, at Homeland Security, um, you, were, you played a critical role in getting that department to an auditable financial right. statement. Um, you were then rewarded by being made CFO at Department of Defense. <laughs> and I guess my question for you is, can you talk about the relative challenge of an auditable financial statement for Homeland Security and an auditable financial statement for the Department of Defense? Is this just a matter of scale or is there a, a difference of kind? It's a difference of kind in part because many of the groups that were in part of the Homeland Security had come from organizations with clean opinions, which meant their staff had accountants, they had people who had passed audits before, and they had people who were used to dealing with the auditors. So some were elevated from like the Coast Guard had used to be immaterial at the Department of Transportation uh, because the highway fund was so large to being the, the largest set of assets. So all of a sudden they were getting a look that they had never had before, which is why they took a long time to turn. But I had an organization filled with people who were familiar with auditors, familiar with accounting, familiar with financial statements. DOD, when we started the audit, hadn't had experience with external auditors on a financial statement. They had GAO auditors and IG auditors, but not, here's the steps of a financial statement audit. So there was a whole cultural shift of understanding what that was like. The other thing was the the complexity of the volume. Now, the nice thing is commercial audits are used to dealing with sampling. They're used to dealing with volume and trying to do this in a manageable way. So they don't go out and count everything in the Department of Defense, but they pick examples and they go into 100% there. And if they find errors, you, the department, are supposed to know, well, if I have an error of that type here, I should probably go look to see if I have the same thing in other places. Those are the types of changes. The biggest thing for the Department of Defense is our primary focus isn't dollars. Social Security Administration, Treasury, their policies and procedures are all around dispersing and receiving dollars. We have equipment, many times bought without any interest in recording how much the depreciated asset value of it was. The answer is, I, I don't care. I wonder the combat value of it. So the records weren't there. So trying to say, do I even want the old records or do I just want to say going forward, if I could record the acquisition price, is that enough? But there were processes in DOD that were never designed to answer a financial statement audit question and aren't necessarily worth the cost to catch them up to that. It's versus going forward. Um, and the value going forward of, of determining the financial value of military assets as opposed to the military value of those assets is worth it? It is because what it what you first have to do is reduce the cost of having that information, right? So I buy 155 millimeter artillery rounds. I know the contract price. The system says the round cost me X number of dollars. I should never have to think or worry about that number again. I knew it at the time I bought it. I entered it with a piece of equipment. It's in a lookup table. I'm not doing this anymore. The thing that transition is, is when people say, well, I want to go value that 10 year old ship. Okay, we can. Uh, in the Coast Guard, they actually sped this process up by saying, for a piece of equipment, what's the modern equivalent? If it was 10 years old and depreciated, they did an, an analogy. But once you have that, it's much easier to add up your inventory and track things the way a private sector does with the dollars. You can understand how depreciation and aging is affecting your equipment. You can look at expense uh, consumption rates. So if you do it right, it can be very valuable. But the key to it is, You've got to really reduce the cost of gathering that information to being trivial. If it's a if it's a survey where you're paying somebody to do an assessment, it's not worth it. I think you've made the point that earlier that, that what you really want is not to get to an auditable financial statement once mm -hmm. or through heroic efforts, but you want a system that can sustain a financial right. statement through good data. Correct. Um, and that gets back to the to the issue we touched on earlier about DOD business systems generally and, and the sort of maze of business systems that we have that we've butted heads, heads up against over a period of decades now. Um, do you have, and, and uh, let me just say, so each of the military services, for example, has, has over the last 20 years tried to put in an en enterprise resource program, mm -hmm. an ERP, yep. to try to improve that process. And those have been 
probably better than what preceded them, yep. but not as good as we want them. Do you have views as to why that's so hard and what we can do to, to, to better improve our business systems? So the challenge that you have, and I'll do the, the financial systems first, then we can go to the business systems, but in a private firm, I do proprietary accounting, which has a set of rules. When I sign a contract, nothing changes, but when I receive the asset, I record the asset and then I record the liability. With the Congress and the power of the purse, you have to do budgetary accounting, which is designed to prevent you from spending money Congress didn't approve. So a department has to do both simultaneously, which means commercial accounting systems don't work because they don't do budgetary accounting. So everybody who's in the federal government who has a system has a federal version designed to track both sets of changes simultaneously. That makes it complicated. If you have rules and procedures that make you special or unique, and everybody in the bureaucracy does, well, now you've modified the system so it doesn't standardize, right? You want to have as much standardization to have an automated system. And if you keep varying yours with custom labor, then every upgrade, every patch requires custom work. That's the single biggest problem for the department is unique requirements that cause you not to be able to use a system the way it was built for everybody else. And you said you're, that's the financial systems. You're going to talk about the, the business systems, right. the contracting systems, personnel systems. So you go to those. An example is the contracting system. For whatever reason, there are contracts that are years old that are still in effect that for legal or other reasons, no one wants to end, which means I have to have the old system to run those transactions because I can't move it to the new system. Those types of not allowed to changes in a commercial firm would lose out to, I am standardizing for efficiency. But in the government, a legal barrier, a mission, those will often stand in the way. And so you end up with these unusual uh, requirements. We used to refer to these, these other business systems sometimes as feeder systems. Yes. Because they feed they, uh, their sources in some cases of authoritative data, so they're used to feed into the financial systems with Correct. that authoritative data. Um, I would have said that one of the problems we have is that those systems, even though they generate authoritative data, are not intended to generate data for financial purposes. They're intended to generate data for other purposes, which makes them not necessarily a perfect match for the financial data that we need. Correct. That, the, you're right. So we, your point is when a private sector firm builds an inventory system, it acquires one that's already designed to update an accounting system. It knows it's supposed to, it knows the firm has to, mm -hmm. or if it's a publicly traded firm, it will, it will need to report it. So it's built into the system from the beginning. Most of the DOD systems didn't have that requirement, so they were built without it. So over time, when they're replaced, you can say, by the way, if you could record this extra number, that would be helpful. But until they are, you've got to bring that data in from somewhere else. So what's the value of the 155? Well, it's not going to be in the logistic system. I've got to know it from somewhere else. And when you bring in that commercial system, you end up telling the people who've been doing business with a DOD unique system for the last 20 or 30 years, you've got to do business differently. Correct. And anyone who goes through change management, government or otherwise, recognizes there's a great deal of attachment to the current system. And it's people often think somebody's doing it because they're stuck in the mud or they're rigid. The answer is they know it. They know its flaws. They know how to fix those flaws by workarounds, and they can make their job happen on the schedule they're supposed to. They don't know any of those things about the new system. But what you find is when you've gone to a new system, it doesn't take very many years before everyone is emotionally attached and understands the new system and would never go back. Right? When they look at the old, why would I, why would I do that? The answer is, well, it's getting over that hurdle in the distance. That's the leadership challenge. Well, let me ask you about a, 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 what I see as, as a structural problem in the Department of Defense mm -hmm. about this, which is that when people buy new systems, they tend mm -hmm. this kind of system, they tend to turn it over to the IT people or the acquisition people and say, buy me a new system, solve my problem with technology. Mm -hmm. When the biggest part of the problem isn't really technology, it's change management, as you described. Right. Um, and I guess the question I have for you is, do you think that we have a system in place in the department that adequately addresses that change management problem? There is not. It is not standardized. There is no place to plug in. Every leader who has to go through this has to have somebody come and explain to them, here's going to be your change management challenge. And what makes it harder is that 
change occurs over a period of time, which is usually much longer than the tenure of any officer who's rotating through or any political appointee. So when you look at the changes, what often makes them work is one person ran that organization during the life of the transition and knew they were going to be there at the end and therefore was emotionally involved in, it has to work when I get there because I'm still going to be around. But that's not a lot of organizations. And that type of continued leadership engagement, willing to change the process, and not being distracted by all the activities of today, which are urgent and involve your leadership, just taking you away from the meetings on the system where there are going to be some change decisions that you're going to have to live with for the rest of its life. I would say that we've probably broken more IT systems over this issue than anything else. Um, when, you, when you came to IDA mm -hmm. a few years ago to speak at our conference on defense mm -hmm. management reform, you had a series of, 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 of rules that you offered or, or principles that you offered for, for successful defense management reform that I think really uh, address this, this change management issue that we're discussing here. I don't know whether you, whether you remember what those rules are, but, but I think it would be helpful if you do, if you, if you wouldn't mind going over them again. Sure. So these were rules that came out of when I was driving change in the Department of Homeland Security. So we had just tried to implement uh, the audit and the internal controls. And I, I worked them, I wrote them down, I worked them out with my, my deputy, and I took them with me when I went to the Pentagon. And it really there are seven rules, and the first one is you need to ask a lot of questions. You need to understand why something is the way it is. And people will tell you, you do that to get buy-in, as if somehow asking somebody for their opinion means they're also going to buy into your new plan. It's also arrogant and wrong. The reason you're doing it is because the person who's been around a while knows something about the process that you don't. And unless you understand them, you're going to miss some of the key challenges that you have to deal with, or you're not going to understand why something is set up a certain way. So that's the first one. The second one is you start have to start out for obstacles. You have to have people who are actively looking down the system. When I get to this stage, when I get to that stage, what's going to be the hurdle? Whose approval am I going to need? What funding am I going to need? What am I going to have to interface with? They're going to bring you bad news. And you have to welcome that. We used to have a picture on the wall of an iceberg from despair.com and the bottom of it was enormous and the top above water was small and it said, remember the problems you've seen are only the tip of them, right? What we realize you had is gonna be vastly larger and more destructive. The whole point was, if you're not looking ahead, you're going to miss this and those are the things that are gonna wreck your plans. So having somebody always doing the scouting just like the military does, somebody down the road looking out. The third one is you have to know the mechanics of the process. If, if you are coming into an organization and you don't, then you need people on your staff who do. You need to understand what are the sequence of events, what are we trying to do, because I can't change a process unless I properly understand it. Once you have that, you also have to have a schedule and a plan, right? If you have a meeting, you don't can walk out with a schedule and a plan. You didn't have a meeting, you just had coffee. So you really need to know who's going to be what by when in order to make the change happen. In a bureaucracy, things get really slow, and if they get too slow, personnel turnover does them in, so you've got to keep it moving. Equally important with that is you've got to measure progress. And this is because in order to keep support going, you've got to be able to show people what did we get for it. So I made a point when I was at the Pentagon that whenever I went to the Hill, I could go on and on about what the benefits we were getting out of the audit, what the savings were, because those people on the Hill who were advocating for it needed to see and know that it was making a difference. If you can't explain that all this effort you put into a change is actually producing a benefit, pretty soon the air goes out of the tire. And frankly, you should ask yourself, why am I doing this? So you got to measure the baseline at the start. You got to measure the progress. Uh, six is you're going to need a champion for change, right? At a certain point, you are going to get to an obstacle that you can't solve. And you need to go to somebody, member of the Hill, somebody in your leadership, who can move that obstacle out of your way. If you're lucky in your career, you become that person. So when I left Comptroller and I moved up to deputy, they were still trying to move the audit. But it was very helpful for the Comptroller to be able to say to people, I understand your concern. Let's go talk to the deputy, knowing that I'd be available to help move those obstacles. And the last one, you got to plan for transition, right? When you look at a, a system of reform in government, if it only occurs in the length of one party's time and disappears in the next one, wasn't really a reform. The key measure of a reform is, does the next team pick it up? 
Do they run with it? Do they build off of it? Do they own it? So you think about the most important thing about Advana is it sort of started with the people who were there before me. They started to lay the groundwork for it. Uh, Mike McCord and his team. We took it, we blew it up, and then when I handed it over to Kath Hicks, she took it to a whole nother level. So it will survive because it's had all these personnel changes. When I was at um, Homeland, my deputy stayed and the new administration appointed her as the CFO. She was able to keep the continuity. So you got to plan for that transition because major reforms in government are going to outlast you. And if you're not ready for it, they'll die when you die. You had, you had made reference to the fact that people in the Department of Defense, senior leaders in the Department mm -hmm. of Defense, have a short half-life. The, mm -hmm. the, the senior civilians, I think, have an average tenure of somewhere between a year and a half and two years. Mm -hmm. um, that's a problem for reform because, as you said, continuity is important. Um, do you have thoughts on talent acquisition at the senior levels? Are there things that we're doing wrong, either as a matter of law or policy or recruiting, that we could do better to get the talent that we need and, and to get people to stay? So I think there's a couple of things. First of all, for Senate confirmed positions, it just takes too long to get through the process. And so you end up with very long vacancies in civilian positions in order to get them filled. And of course, when you have a vacancy, then everyone has to cascade up to try and fill it. Uh, so that's one of the challenges in recruiting. I think part of it is also, do you need them to be Senate confirmed, right? Can I, if I'm trying to bring an outside talent, uh, you know, we had the issue when we were there, we had a Senate confirmed CIO. And I think part of that was people wanted to say, we really value the CIO. Okay. But if I'm trying to talk to somebody who's really a CIO in a commercial industry, do I really want them to say, by the way, it's going to take you six months to switch over? Or do I want to say, I want you to come in right away, start right away and, and deliver. And therefore, I don't need it to be political Senate confirmed. I need that person to be able to start. So those are some of the issues, I think, with some cases, trying to be able to bring people into government uh, other than always up through the, the bottom. I mean, when we mentioned at the beginning, the Presidential Management Intern Now Fellows Program, it was designed to get people in midway through and have them go up their career path uh, without starting at the very entry level. But it's still, it's hard to get that when, if you look at any corporation, the percentage of their senior people who didn't come through their organization is usually kind of high. And in Defense Department, in the career civil service, they all came up through the process. Um, from having worked in, one of the things you hear about this is that um, the department is very rank conscious mm -hmm. and that there's a problem of trying to get the right people in the room if you have some of them who are Senate confirmed and some of them who are not Senate confirmed. Do you see that as an issue with bringing in people laterally who are not Senate confirmed for senior, senior roles? It can be. I've certainly dealt with people in the department who are very rank conscious. But I think over time, people start to understand who are the people in the department who are getting something done and who are the people who have the support of the secretary or the deputy and what they're trying to do. And as I explain to people, somebody can be a special assistant, but if everybody knows they speak on behalf of the secretary, they will be able to drive change. If you give them a very fancy title and the secretary doesn't want to meet with them, that person's not going to be able to accomplish much. So I think people can start focused on rank, but usually pretty quickly people can get, most people can get past that and be focused on, is this person driving change and do they executing the vision of the leadership? I can remember having a case when I was a Senate confirmed official and I was trying to work out something with a different office, in this case, CAPE, mm -hmm. where it became clear to me that I was in a debate with somebody who was an analyst at CAPE. Mm -hmm. And in order to communicate, I either had to talk to the director of CAPE, who would then go down his chain and get the mm -hmm. answer, come back up to him and talk to me, or I had to go down my chain to the person who could talk to the person at mm -hmm. his level and come back. And I said, can't I bring this guy into my office and just talk to him? And the answer was no. Um, I don't know if that's something you've experienced, but, but it, and I can see why mm -hmm. an office would be sensitive about that, because the, the theory is somehow I'm going to browbeat this person because I'm, you know, however many levels higher. Uh, but sometimes a direct conversation is much more efficient. So I've had that come up when I was the deputy over, they should come to your office or you shouldn't go to theirs. Yes. I don't care. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it'll be more interesting if I show up at their door and say hi. Uh, and I think part of that is who can you have a relationship? I think a little bit if there's too much of a, a structure gap, that person doesn't know where they're able to agree because they don't know what their leadership's right. position is. So you have to go to to someone who feels empowered to tell you yeah. if they disagree. Um, last question. Sure. Um, 
What advice would you have for people who are coming into the department at senior levels now or in the future? Is there, are, are, are there a few words of wisdom you'd be willing to share to close this interview? Yeah, I think the key thing is after you've put, gotten oriented to your position, decide what the two or three meaningful changes are you want to have happen while you're there. There's going to be lots of activity. There's going to be lots of times you need to go give speeches, meetings to attend. But if you can't anchor back on these are the three things I'm trying to get done, make sure they're vetted so you know the right idea with the vision, that you've got the competent people to lead them. But you're going to have to keep coming back to them and pushing them along for them to be successful. And if you don't have that short list in front of you, and it's got to be short. If you've made too many things, your time's going to get pulled in every direction. You're going to struggle. So if you keep those three in mind, do all the other stuff, but come back to those three each week. Did I move these forward? That's the thing that's going to really help you leave a lasting change. Thank you, David. That was great. Thank you, Peter. Good to see you.